Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump into introducing tonight's session. Um, now we're going to talk about uh, hiring and training process for deputy sheriffs with the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. And for those of you that are new to University Place, uh, UPPD is actually a contract agency with the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. So all of our commissioned officers are actually deputies with the Sheriff's Department, but we're assigned here. We're selected from the group uh, from the Sheriff's Department to work full time at UPPD as your police department. So our officers fall under the policies, the procedures, the hiring and everything of the Sheriff's Department. So it's it's important if you understand as to our presenters are going to be representatives from the Sheriff's Department and understand that those are everything that they're telling you are things that apply to our officers here at UPPD. Um, Tonight's presenter is Deputy Alex Richards. He is our department's training coordinator, so he works a little bit with the hiring process uh, for our officers, as well as then seeing them through all the training aspects uh, of our new hires, whether it's the in-house training, the academy training, uh, and their post-academy training as, as they get ready to uh, work on patrol on the streets. Um, I think that's all I had for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and try to turn this over to to Alex. All right. Okay, hang on. Let me get you. Let me spotlight him. All right. Well, thank you for uh, coming out tonight. Thank you, Chief Primo, for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Alex Richards. I'm a deputy sheriff at the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, assigned full time to our uh, training division, um, which is uh, a big privilege for me. I've uh, been with the department for about eight years, uh, held various assignments from patrol uh, to uh, some investigations and traffic, and now in, in the training division. Something I'm very passionate about, so I'm really delighted to be here tonight to talk to you guys about our processes. Again, we I am a representative of the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, who uh, is also um, services uh, the university, university Place community. Uh, through a contract uh, with the city. Uh, it is uh, it's a big honor for most of our deputies when they get selected to be a part of one of our contract cities. Um, and it's something that's pretty competitive, quite frankly, for, for a lot of the deputies. Um, myself, I, I uh, run our field training officer program, our uh, pre-academy uh, pre uh, orientation program, and run up, basically teach new cops how to be cops. Um, so it's it's something that uh, I feel pretty strongly about and that I can talk about. So I'm going to start off though kind of chronologically with the process. So our process starts out in the in the recruitment of, of people from our community. So we recruit new employees from all over the place. Uh, we can recruit people from out of state. We can recruit people from across the state. We can recruit people from uh, within our own community. We prefer to stay within our own community. We focus most of our efforts uh, through our full time recruiter uh, within our own community and those uh, recruitment processes take place on anything from a job fair to uh, schools to colleges, college campuses and even military uh, facilities. Many of our representatives of the department come from a background uh, where they were either assigned at Joint Base Lewis McCord or at another base and had some kind of contact with some of our uh, reserve uh, reserves that uh, serve on our department. Um, we also represent at community events all over the place. I'm sure you've seen us here at the various community events, duck days and things like that within the community. And that those serve as recruiting events for us as well. Many times I've served on them uh, myself. Uh, the community members will come out and ask, how do I become a deputy sheriff? How do I become a university place police officer? And so we talk to them. We talk to them about their background, their history, what they're interested in, and really try to engage with, with the people. Becoming a police officer is a calling for most, uh, most of our people. Uh, it's not something that you just get into because you want to make money. It's not something you just get into because you want to stay busy. It's something you get into because you feel that higher calling. And for us, those are the people that we look for. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the big um, subjects uh, in the community these days is what does our department look like in reference to our community? And we look at that uh, not only from uh, all the various socioeconomic status uh, that people come from, race, 
uh, but also their background and what their experience is. So for example, just on Monday, we had a group of three entry level uh, deputy sheriffs start uh, their careers with the department. Um, and they came from all different walks of life. Uh, one was a, a, a mechanic at a, a local dealership. Uh, he was the head of the service department at one point in his career. One came from the grocery business and the produce quality control department of a major grocery chain in the area. These are people that represent not only our community, but bring a vast array of uh, experience to our department. So we can relate to people as they're experiencing different types of crisis or different types of, if they're victims of different types of crimes. So it's very important to us to look not only at the obvious factors, but look at deep, uh, deep down inside and how are we representing our community. Uh, our employees, uh, as it says, are what makes us a well-rounded uh, and diverse department. That's, we are the Pierce County Sheriff's Department. We have an elected sheriff. Uh, we have you as in University Place, have an appointed chief. Uh, they run our culture, but the culture is driven by the deputies and the officers that work within the city and the department. And so we work really hard to recruit people that not only fit in with the culture and are hard workers and really have the desire to do the job, but it's also uh, working to make sure that we are representing uh, who our community really is. So when someone comes to us and says, I want to become a deputy sheriff, where we turn them to is a company that we contract with uh, to run our entry level testing. Uh, the entry level testing uh, for us is, uh, is something that we have found that it's a lot better for us to run, run this through a private company who can recruit from all over the area but also has uh, an easier access to the testing um, to the testing material. So candidates don't necessarily have to wait for us to be open and, and hiring at that moment. If it's convenient for them, if they find themselves where they're able to test at one location or another, it's a lot more open for them. There's several locations. So for us, there's really a big thing about community access to becoming a sheriff's deputy or police officer. So they're, they sign up for a test and they have to take a written test. Written test is a basic uh, aptitude test where we test for everything from uh, your written skill uh, of, of reading and, and writing comprehension. Uh, they take a video assessment where they're looking at scenarios and answering how they would react to those scenarios and uh, various multiple choice tests uh, uh, questions where they're able to kind of assess their general knowledge. Uh, contrary to common belief, when you look at uh, the show Cops or some of these live TV shows, this job is not about jumping out of the car every day, driving fast and doing all those fun things. This job is about really connecting with the community and also uh, doing a lot of uh, writing <laughs> and reading. So uh, we have to test for that because when we respond to your house or to your neighbor's house, we have to be able to, uh, to communicate what we have done uh, and what has happened. So once the candidate has completed their written test and passed, then they move on to the physical agility test. Physical agility test is a test that tests the basic uh, functions. It's a basic test. It's nothing um, that I would say is insurmountable by anybody, um, but it tests to make sure that if I were to respond to your house, that I could actually perform any kind of physical function that would, that would be necessary. Um, so physic physical agility test com is comprised of a 300 meter sprint, um, which the candidates are timed on and they have to meet a certain requirement, requirement for that timing. After they complete the sprint, they do push-ups. It's a maximum effort push-up test, untimed. They're able to push out as many push-ups as they possibly can uh, until failure, essentially. Um, at that point, give them a little bit of rest and then they move on to sit-ups. The sit-up test, is uh, challenging. Uh, it's something that's uh, done in one minute. And um, in the one minute sit up test, you're basically uh, giving maximum effort as well. After they've completed that, then they move on to a mile and a half run, where again, they're timed on the mile and a half run. And at that point, uh, they've either passed or failed. Each event is provided a score, and uh, they have, a, have to score a maximum uh, amount of, or a minimum score in order to pass the test. 
The test is the same for every candidate in the state. So we don't do anything special uh, or different uh, for our department. We use what the academy uses as their entry exam uh, to test our folks to ensure that once they go to the police academy, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, that they're able to, to pass those tests. Once they've done that and they've selected the Pierce County Sheriff's Department as a department that they want to apply for, they are the, their scores are then sent to our civil service division, which is uh, separate from the sheriff's department. And the civil service division compiles lists of, of eligible applicants for us. Now, mind you, when we receive the list, there are not uh, any criminal background checks or anything like that done on these people. It's very basic screening information that, that we receive. So once we receive the list, we may have anywhere from 30 to 60 to 150 people. It all depends on how many people are choosing the sheriff's department. And then that list will go on to our background investigations division. Our background investigations division uh, will then receive the list and they'll screen, the, do an initial screening of those employees through what we call a personal history statement. Personal history statement is a very long and arduous process. Uh, we ask for everything. We ask for every neighbor uh, that you know of that could vouch for your character. We ask for every person you've ever lived with uh, so that we can contact them and see what you're like when we're not around. Uh, we ask for every employer, all those types of things. And then the obvious criminal background portion of that. The personal history statement, we moved recently to an online portal, which is uh, again, increased access to, uh, to our candidates to be able to fill that out uh, a little bit easier than it was. So again, trying to bring that, that barrier down and make it a little less cumbersome to people. Um, once we receive that, we do an initial criminal background check on the person, uh, as would be ex expected. We don't get too in depth in that. We do basic running them through uh, our, our various systems that we have available to us uh, to, to get that information. Then we conduct a one-on-one, -on -one, what we call pre-oral interview. And that one-on-one -on -one interview is where the background investigator will sit down with the person and really go through that packet that they filled out, that personal history statement that they filled out and pick it apart uh, and find anything that might be concerning to us or anything that we might need clarification on. Um, most things are pretty easy to explain. Um, so we find that that's a good place for us to sit one-on-one -on -one with people and really do that screening to figure out if they're gonna be uh, eligible to be uh, a deputy number one and then number two, kind of get the feeling of whether or not they, uh, they are going to be a good fit with our department. During those one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, there's no holds barred. Uh, we ask everything. Uh, we have some uncomfortable conversations sometimes, um, and we've had some interesting disclosures during those uncomfortable conversations, uh, but they're important uncomfortable conversations that we have to have to ensure that the people that are on the road are uh, truly screened and viable uh, and are going to be good quality employees for our department for a long career. Um, once they've completed that process and they have not revealed anything that would disqualify them, which there's a ton of things that may or may not disqualify a candidate, then we move on to oral boards. Our oral boards are comprised of three Sheriff's Department employees and then one person that's recording that interview uh, in, in that's occurring. The person recording is not a part of the, uh, the actual uh, interview. They don't ask questions. They just facilitate the conversation. Uh, the oral boards are standardized. It's uh, all the questions are screened and fair. Every candidate is asked the exact same questions. We don't provide any preferential treatment and the questions are not provided to any candidates prior to, uh, to the uh, oral board. It looks like there's a question. I'm going to ask you a question and you can repeat it. Okay. Uh, what are the kinds of things that turn up on a screening that would disqualify them? So uh, the question was, what are the type of things that would turn up on a screen that may disqualify a person? Uh, again, the, the list is, is pretty long. Uh, there are many things that could disqualify you. Things such as drug use uh, are pretty a pretty big uh, thing for us. We still don't allow employees to uh, use marijuana, for example. 
Uh, that's still against our policy. It may be legal in the state of Washington, but uh, they are not allowed to use that. So we have a time frame that uh, candidates have to have not used marijuana where that had changed where prior to that it was uh, pretty much no use. Um, something uh, something like domestic violence issues in your past, things uh, like uh, employee theft at previous uh, previous employers, those types of things are common uh, disqualifiers that we run into. And also minimizing uh, some of the things that you may or may not be disclosing. It's very easy to tell if someone is disclosing something in a full and, and uh, truthful way versus minimizing and saying you know trying to make something seem like it may just go away um, our detectives and uh, background investigators are very good at picking up on those cues and we back all of it up with a polygraph examination um, and that i'll get into here in a second Does that hopefully answer yeah. <laughs> um, once they uh during the oral board i'll get back to the oral boards during the oral boards uh they are seated in 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 the building and the panel of three uh, people, uh, employees of the Sheriff's Department, uh, ask the questions. We have a representative on each board that acts as a, uh, a peer, one that acts as a supervisor, and one that acts as an administrator. We try to get representatives from each one of those, uh, those positions within the department uh, to ask those actual questions. They then provide a numerical score and comments uh, on the answer for each one of those questions. The questions are then tallied, that numerical score is then calculated, and that goes into their overall uh, placement on the list as a, as a person on the list. Um, once they do their oral board and they pass, uh, that's the ideal uh, situation, then we do a polygraph examination and a suitability assessment report. The suitability assessment report is uh, basically a psychological report where we ask a lot of the, the questions to ensure that the person's uh, uh, mild mannered, that they're not, uh, don't have anger management issues, those types of things. Um, kind of gets really in depth on, on your personality. You think of it kind of like a personality questionnaire, um, which is then evaluated by a psychologist. So we have a psychologist that we contract with that will actually do interviews with the person and review the, those reports in order to clear the person to ensure that they uh, don't have some of those issues. One of the cool things about uh, our department and all departments in the state of Washington, one of the, it's actually the law, is that every law enforcement officer has to submit to a polygraph examination uh, upon, uh, during their background process. Polygraph examination, uh, while intimidating, as we've, all of us who've gone through it is very intimidating, uh, it's a very important part of our process uh, for two reasons. One, it verifies what you've told us is accurate and true. And two, it ensures that anything that you haven't told us that we're able to, to figure out what's going on. We may not necessarily figure out exactly what you haven't told us, but we ask questions in a way that'll figure out categories of what you may not have told us. You don't necessarily pass or fail a polygraph. What they evaluate for is deception. So they evaluate to see if you're being deceptive on a question, whether that's minimizing, lying, or not telling us at all. Um, so they're able to do that. Go ahead with the question. Um, this is my question, okay. which is, do you know the hiring standards in, in the state of Washington, how they compare nationally? Um, do we have some sort of, I mean, are we tougher? Or do you do not know? I, I'm not 100% sure. I do know that one of the, she, they probably didn't have a question. Yeah, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, are, how do Pierce County Sheriff's Department or the state of Washington's hiring standards compare nationally uh, with, with uh, law enforcement agencies nationally? I would say based on my experience, I do not know the answer to the question. Based on my experience, uh, we have a high caliber of employees that are attempting to even get the job. Uh, something like a polygraph examination is not required nationally. It is not a national standard. There are some states that require it and some that don't, and I don't know the answer to as to how many. Um, I will say that is a big 
a big portion of the fear factor for us when conducting uh, our background investigation to ensure that people are telling the truth. That's what we're really after. And we want truthful, honest candidates that are coming here for the right reasons, and those things are, are screened. So once the employee uh, completes the polygraph examination and passes, then we conduct employment and home checks. So we go a little more in depth uh, where we will actually go talk to neighbors. We'll knock on doors. We'll go visit the person's house to see how well they keep their house uh, to ensure that um, the people representing uh, you and people that are serving you are, are good representatives of our community. And things that we're looking for are when we're talking to neighbors, is this person, uh, have you heard them throwing loud parties where things have gotten out of hand? Do you hear them screaming and yelling at their spouse or significant other? Do you see them doing strange activities in the middle of the night? Have you noticed anything that would be out of the ordinary? Do you, are they a good neighbor? That's a, good, a question we ask. Those types of questions are what make us representatives of the community. If someone's not a good neighbor, I don't want them to be at my house. So those are things that we ask. Alex, yes. apparently they, they can hear me. Okay. Somebody mentioned they could. So what are the percentage of applicants that enter the process that get all the way through? That's a great question. So just prior to coming here, I talked to uh, Deputy Malloy, who's our lead background investigator. He's actually the one in the photo behind this slide. Uh, he advised me that since 2019, we have processed 333 eligible applicants. Uh, where they've met all of our standards, all of our uh, criteria for um, for disqualification. Of the 333, we've hired 28. So we have, uh, that's less than 10%. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you think about that, that's a pretty high standard to meet. And that doesn't mean that if someone didn't make it, that they may not become eligible later, or that they may, enough time may pass where they may gain a little more life experience allow some of the things that may have been a disqualifier before to pass and maybe we sh we see some more life experience behind them that where they've shown a positive track. Um, I am aware of people that uh, have not passed the, their first time applying and then they've come back five years later, three years later, and they've become eligible because they've shown a better track record of, uh, of their behavior or of, uh, of whatever it is that disqualified them or made a change. Could be something as simple as too many traffic tickets uh, where they drove and were a little bit of a reckless driver and so then they had to clean their act up in order to get the job so once all the backgrounds done every criminal check we can possibly run nationwide internationally we do uh, every employment check every house check checking references talking to family talking to friends then we say whether or not we want to hire this person how do we do that, you may ask? We have what's called a candidate assessment meeting. In the candidate assessment meeting, as people, representatives from our command staff, uh, who will then review each candidate. The law recently changed, and it used to be called a rule of three. Now it's called a rule of five, where for every one opening we have, we have to consider the top five candidates that are available to us. So we go through the rule of five. We will uh, review their packet. The background investigator assigned to that person will basically present the person to the command staff. Command staff will then make a decision based on what they were presented on whether or not they feel that we should hire this person. And they consider everything. They consider the psychologist's review of the person, whether or not the psychologist believes they're low, medium, or high risk, uh, uh, high risk higher. Uh, they'll consider uh, you know, their background. They'll consider where they're coming from, some of the life experience that they bring to our department. Once the candidate assessment meeting is completed, then we receive a, a list and the person is given a conditional offer of employment. The conditional offer of employment is conditional upon a medical evaluation by a doctor uh, where they um, where they will uh, essentially ensure that they're healthy enough to be a cop. Uh, at that point, then they're offered a final uh, offer of employment, and then they begin with the sheriff's department. Just want to pause here and ensure there's no other questions on the background investigations portion and the, and the recruiting portion. Because after this, we're going to get more into once they're actually an employee of the sheriff's department um, and going through that process. 
Um, I have a question. I know I'm on the phone. I can't see the slide because I'm having technical difficulty. So can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. So my question is like, I understand the hiring process. So if somebody has come from out of state, um, they wanted to um, get employed with the department from Washington State, like for example, with, with you guys, do you, is it the same process or because they already have the experience the process is less is limited because they already went through the beginning of the process in another state. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the question was, if you couldn't hear it, it's basically if you're coming from another state, either as a law enforcement officer or even just as a regular civilian, uh, where do we pick them up in the process is kind of how I understood that. Uh, so essentially, if you are a lateral applicant, whether it's out of state or in state, uh, we can uh, we still conduct the same exact background uh, investigation. Uh, for example, we've had uh, employees of a local police department, um, large police department in the area that have uh, recently come to us. They submitted to the same exact background investigation uh, and polygraph examination and everything that an entry level applicant does. We don't skip anything. We don't give preferential treatment in the background to what we call lateral officers. Uh, lateral officers, however, don't have to take the written examination and the physical agility test. The assumption would be that they've already passed the basic aptitude to become a police officer and basic physical agility test, but we still want to make sure that they are suitable for our department. And that's through, again, the same psychological testing, the same polygraph examination, the same background check, uh, talking to references, neighbors, all those things still occur with every single employee of the Sheriff's Department. And that includes our civilian employees. We do the same background polygraph and uh, and everything, oral boards for our civilian employees, everything from our offices, office assistants to our forensics technicians, everybody submits to this. And the reason is we, you guys put your trust in us and we want to make sure that we are, we are deemed trustworthy. And that's our one way that we can prove that we're trustworthy uh, in our eyes. Two questions, yeah. Alex, I'll give you one at a time. Mm -hmm. What's the typical average timeline from initial application to getting hired? So that's, uh, it's a long process. It can take anywhere from three to six months, uh, depending on if we're hiring or not. Uh, right now we happen to be hiring, so please, if you're interested, apply. <laughs> uh, we are hiring uh, 20, we got authorized to hire 26 deputies this year. So we're uh, about halfway there right now, um, and we intend on hiring two more times this year. Uh, however, uh, it's about a three to six month process if you're an entry level. Three months is on the very aggressive uh, fast end, but it's not a fast process because we have to go through so many checks and ensure that we provide ample opportunity for that feedback. So the moral of the story is if you want the job, you really got to want it and you have to stick with it. That's why it's a calling. Many people that stick with it, it's because their passion is something they've always wanted to do or something that they felt called to do. Um, hopefully that answers that. Thank you, Alex. How does the department feel about someone's social media content and how it impacts their employment considerations? Uh, another great question. Our uh, background investigators do look at social media pretty heavily. Uh, they look at it very intensely and they will go back as far as they can go. Um, we uh, obviously in today's day and age, social media is a very big thing. Uh, most people have some kind of account, uh, some one way or another. And uh, we not only will ask them to review it, uh, but we will also do searches on our own uh, through some of our own resources uh, and open source types of things in order to figure out if they have a presence. Um, my, my recommendation would be that if you are uh, applying or if you're looking to become a law enforcement officer in any agency is uh, to, to not <laughs> post too much. Um, if it's something like family photos, all those kind of things is great. But what I tell all of our new hires, the day they get hired and they were already aware of it because they went through the scrutiny before, is to keep it clean. There's no reason, nobody needs to, nobody needs to tarnish our reputation or tarnish their placement in the community by posting radical things. It's not something that we condone, it's not something that we do. And if it is done, we not only have, uh, we'll disqualify that candidate in the very beginning, but we have ongoing department policies that prohibit that kind of stuff. 
I hope that answers that. Okay. All right. Well, if there's not any more questions about the background and recruiting uh, portion, we're going to get to once they get hired. Once they get hired, it's uh, it's an exciting time for me because that's when I take over. Uh, it's where I know the most about. Um, and this is from day one where we are working with the individual to develop the culture. And I think the Pierce County Sheriff's Department, University Place Police Department, every department that we contract with uh, has a deeper connection with our department than most communities do with their law enforcement agencies. We again, we try to represent our community, we try to be involved in our communities, and we try to not only be involved, but be a part of that community. Uh, I myself live in Pierce County. Uh, most deputies live in Pierce County. Uh, tons of deputies and officers live in University Place. So it's uh, one of those things where it's we consider it it's, you're our neighbors. So we're not out here coming in, driving in from, from another city or, or area coming into the, to this agency. So we really believe in the mission of our department, which is uh, the mission of the department, the Pierce County Sheriff's Department is to protect life and property uphold rights and work in partnership to build strong, safe communities. From day one, we instill this into our new hires. Um, whether they're lateral entry, lateral or entry level, we instill this. If you notice, one of the most important portions of our mission statement, which we live and breathe every day, is the work in partnership. That was changed uh, several years ago as a part of an initiative for us to become more involved in the community. We don't view law enforcement as us coming in being dictators uh, to the community. We view our success as the success of the partnerships that we build. If you don't trust us, you won't call us. Uh, so we are uh, we do a lot of community outreach. We try to be involved. We try to be accessible. We try to be approachable and really build those partnerships. We have everything from problem oriented policing here in University Place. Uh, to community liaison uh, deputies that are assigned throughout Pierce County that can help in any way to help build those relationships and attend community meetings and address community problems that that are important uh, at that time. So we really try to try to work towards that. We on day one set the expectations for our new hires. Uh, it's rare for an agency to do that. It's rare for a company to do that. And if you think about it, we have a pretty clear job description. Uh, it's, you know, when you go apply to become a sheriff's deputy or a police officer anywhere, there's a job description. But what's beyond that? The expectation beyond that is to live and breathe the mission. And we do that through uh, accomplishing that through uh, some core values too. Respect, responsibility, courage, compassion, and integrity are some of the core values that we live and we instill. And we talk about we have the difficult conversation on day one that you're excited today, but what do you look like in 10 to 15 years when you've seen and done some things? You've seen some of the worst parts of society. You've seen some of the worst incidents that have occurred. You, you get worn out. It's almost a, a PTSD type of uh, thing. You have to go back and rely on those core values in order to continue forward and, and be, a port, be a positive contributor to our community. We live and breathe that. Baby. Our oh, employees I'm, are put through a 240-hour okay. new hire orientation. The 240-hour new hire orientation includes not only that uh, that expectations and ethics courses, but it also includes the basics: firearms training, 40 hours of firearms training to ensure that our deputies. Are, uh, are using their uh, their weapons appropriately and that they're skilled and proficient in those skills. We have 56 hours of defensive tactics training, unheard of for agencies to do this. This is all above and beyond what they will receive in the basic law enforcement academy, but we want to ensure that our employees are better than others, that our deputies and officers for, for contract cities have superior skills uh, and superior knowledge. We run them through 30 hours of patrol procedures and scenario training where they see everything from building searches, do traffic stops, high risk vehicle stops, and those types of things. We run them through that four hours of department expectations, four hours of telling them what we expect from them throughout their career. And then five hours of emotional survival training 
where we talk about some of the stressors that are going to come throughout their career and how they can survive those stressors. And I'm not talking about surviving in anything other than uh, than their personal life. Uh, it, it takes being a deputy takes a personal toll. Uh, you carry that baggage with you every day. Uh, some of the things that you see. And so how do you keep and, and keep unloading that bag so that it doesn't become too heavy? Um, we also do discriminatory harassment training. We uh, talk a lot about uh, uh, basic police work and how we need to be fair and equitable in, in how we enforce the law and how we uh, conduct our work. Our new hire orientation training is, again, unheard of. Most departments don't do as in-depth of a job as we do. Uh, again, we had three deputies start on Monday. Two weeks prior to that, we had four deputies start. Uh, during that time, we get to know them. We get to know who they are. We get to know their strengths, their weaknesses. We get to pull some of their experience that they bring with them, whether they're a lateral uh, candidate coming from another agency and seeing some of the things. What did they do at their other agency? Can we incorporate that? Is that a better practice? We're always looking to improve. Our way is not the best way. It's a way. Uh, and we try to make it the best way, but excellence is what we strive for. And again, excellence is sometimes unattainable. Uh, but that's how you keep growing. So we go through that, we learn their, who they are, and we pull from their experience, and then we try to match them up during our uh, pre-academy field training, which again, unheard of, where we put these deputies on the road for pre-academy field training, where they get to learn their basics. How do you go and talk to people? How do you treat people? How do you respond to a domestic violence call? How do you respond to a DUI call? How do you respond to a collision? All those different types of things. We've had deputies that come on our commission that have never been to academy before and have done some really impactful things in the community, whether it's buying lunch for uh, a person that's on the street that's hungry, or it's uh, you know helping a domestic violence uh, victim uh, uh, get some uh, re resolution to their call. Um, all those types of things our deputies are doing. We give them that experience, which gives them practical real life experience in the academy. The academy is a uh, very long five month process, but it's during our pre academy field training that they really get that foundation of skills uh, and exposure to those various types of calls that uh, builds them as, as great deputies. Uh, that process lasts anywhere from four to 12 weeks. Typically, right now, we're looking at about 12 weeks because the academy was closed down due to COVID for quite a while. Um, we've run it up to 16 weeks, uh, and it's gone as short as four weeks where we were able to get that recruit or that deputy into the academy very quick. Um, that process is not up to us. How long they wait is not up to us. We don't have preferential treatment over any other department at the academy. The academy uh, selects uh, who goes there based on when they apply. The day that they get hired with the Sheriff's Department or selected during that candidate assessment meeting, we submit an application to the Academy, get them, get them in the Academy as soon as possible. And that portion of, of their training, this pre-Academy field training, uh, is, uh, is a time that they can grow and where they're just uh, right before they actually attend the, the Academy. I'm going to move on to the to the police academy. All of our uh, deputies and uh, the officers that serve at, in University Place Police Department have attended the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission. And I throw this slide up here. Uh, it's a quote from Plato. Uh, and it's basically, it's an important quote. It says, in a, in a republic that honors the core of democracy, the greatest amount of power is given to those called guardians. Only those of the most impeccable character are chosen to bear the responsibility of protecting the democracy. The operating word here is guardian uh, and democracy. Guardians uh, have a different mindset than warriors. Prior to 2012, the academy pushed a warrior mindset where they wanted to train police officers to become warriors. And while there are warrior aspects to our job, uh, it's important that we frame our mindset into more of guardians. And I think that that's an important differentiation. And I brought with me a, uh, a quote from a, a paper that Sue Rar, the director of the, of the Criminal Justice Training Commission for Washington State says. 
and I'll read it to you. The missions and rules of engagement are completely different. The soldier's mission is that of a warrior to conquer. The rules of engagement are dedicated, or sorry, are decided before the battle. The police officer's mission is that of a guardian to protect. The rules of engagement evolve as the incident unfolds. Soldiers must follow orders. Police officers must make independent decisions. Soldiers come into communities as an outside occupying force. Guardians are members of the community protecting from within. This is not a simple distinction because the role of a police officer is not one dimensional. There are times when the guardian officer must fight fierce battles as a warrior without hesitation or apology. So our guardians must also possess the skills of a warrior. The challenge of the training of training new police recruits is to equip them with the judgment and confidence to properly balance both roles rather than simply follow orders. We need police officers with the skill and tenacity of a warrior, but the mindset of a guardian. And I think that's pretty impactful. Sue Rar uh, was a King County Sheriff, uh, and she came in as uh, the leader of the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission and has really made uh, big reforms to the police academy and big reforms to policing in general. We've been doing this for years. Reform in our police society today in Washington State and in Pierce County is not new. We've been working on trying to be a better uh, part of this community and to not be the dictatorship that uh, may have occurred back um, prior to in, in years past, but really be those guardians of the community. And I think you see that when you interact with our deputies and officers and in, in UP. So Basic Law Enforcement Academy is comprised of 720 hours of uh, Washington State uh, Criminal Justice Training Commission sanctioned training. That was a big, <laughs> a big statement. Um, th was there a question? No, they just, they, everybody really likes oh. your distinction between warrior and uh, guardian. Perfect. Uh, so the 720 hour BLEA uh, Basic Law Enforcement Academy hosted uh, training uh, is where we send all of our recruits and every police record with the recruit with the exception of the Washington State Patrol goes there. Washington State Patrol has their own academy where they focus uh, really heavily on uh, traffic enforcement, collisions, and things of that nature. They still get all of the basic law enforcement, but they provide a little bit of a, an extra focus there uh, for the mission of their job. And uh, the Basic Law Enforcement Academy, which is hosted in Berrien, Washington, our recruits will drive down there every day, commute. Uh, it's a wonderful commute. I've done it myself uh, during rush hour traffic. And uh, they'll go down there and they are uh, involved in a class uh, of approximately 30 other recruits. And those classes are uh, comprised of everyone from Seattle Police Department to uh, Tacoma Police Department to Gig Harbor Police Department to Spokane County Sheriff to everywhere across the state. They're all trained the same. Um, that's where you build that foundation of knowledge again. So we've already introduced them to police work through our uh, our pre-academy process and then their pre-academy field training process and then they go and uh, get that that real criminal law knowledge and, and all that and the next slide we're going to show you is a breakdown of what they learn so they spent 260 hours learning about criminal investigations criminal law criminal procedures patrol procedures traffic investigations and ethics these things are what they consider the fundamental knowledge of a police officer. This is that learning what the, the RCWs or the revised code of Washington, what the laws that govern what we do are. Uh, then they spend about 250 hours refining their physical skills. And that's everything from defensive tactics uh, to firearms to emergency vehicle operation. We spend 40 hours learning how to drive again, uh, which is important as you see. Uh, 74 hours of applied training, which are mock scenes. So again, just like those uh, those patrol procedure mock scenes that we run, uh, the academy will run them, and they do a fabulous job. They bring in outside actors to play different scenarios, play victims, play suspects, dress up, put makeup on that has blood, all those different types of things. And our our deputies are able to then go to those scenes and 
act as if they're real police officers uh, solving that problem. Again, this is where our pre-academy FTO program comes into effect. Our deputies have already seen real domestic violence issues. They've already seen real crashes. They've seen real suspects and actually made arrests, put handcuffs on people, and also dealt with people in crisis. Um, the, de the deputies and, and all uh, recruits in the academy are going to spend approximately 64 hours studying and reviewing and doing basic stuff. And then a big one is uh, the uh, communications and behavior management. This is, again, one of the biggest hot topics uh, that you'll see today in, in the news and uh, something that we deal with quite frequently. And one of the topics that they cover that I wanted to touch on because I think it's important is uh, blue courage. And blue courage, uh, again, is that introduction of the key concepts of procedural justice, where we talk about being neutral, where your decisions are not biased, they're not based on anything other than behavior uh, and, and actions of the person, where you're treating people with respect, where you're not just coming in as that authoritarian and saying, I'm the law, you do what I say, that is not an appropriate way to conduct business. It's treating that person as if they're your neighbor, they're your grandma, they're your sister, your brother, whatever it may be. Uh, where you're allowing people to, to, to provide a voice, there's nothing worse than a police officer that comes that doesn't allow you to tell your side of the story. Whether you're the suspect or the victim, whether you're trying to flag them down, all those types of things are important. We need to listen. One of the biggest things I think, uh, I was talking to one of our, the chiefs in our department recently, and he mentioned one of the things law enforcement needs to do right now is listen. And this is one of the topics that they're taught. And I think that's something that's very important for us to do is just listen to the community. What do you have to say? Listen to the suspect, listen to the victim, listen to everyone, then create the, uh, the conclusion to, to the call. And then making decisions that are gonna that are going to further us in our trustworthiness in the community and not uh, not uh, lose uh, your trust. Uh, trust is not uh, given to us. What? It's earned, earned. It, and I think it's important to, to ensure that that is not violated. Uh, during the uh, academy, our recruits are provided uh, crisis training, quite a bit of it. Uh, crisis training, while we ca can calculate it down to about 40 hours of crisis training, Crisis training is really integrated within all of the curriculum, within all of the, the patrol procedures, within all of the mock teams that they do. And they'll discuss things like emotional intelligence, knowing yourself, knowing your thoughts, knowing how to, how to manage yourself. De-escalation techniques uh, are important. Learning how to talk to people rather than just going up hot and bothered, we're gonna listen again. That's a de-escalation technique. Learning how to de-escalate based on uh, various things. One of the things that the academy has pushed out is traumatic brain injuries and autism awareness and things like that, that as a police officer prior to this, I had no idea about. But the academy uh, is pushing out this information to our recruits and to the deputies and officers that are working in Pierce County uh, currently in order to ensure that we are up to date on all the current uh, issues and how to, how to ensure that we're handling them properly, how to recognize things that may be a crisis situation and may not necessarily be a criminal uh, incident. Uh, we talk about crisis management, and that could be anything from a traumatic incident to a, uh, a person that's experiencing uh, some sort of uh, trauma in their life. Oops, sorry. Uh, and then uh, identifying that mental health behavior, intervention strategies. And one of the things they do talk about is a, a uh, circumstance called excited delirium, um, which is uh, drug-induced uh, uh, delirium, typically where uh, our deputies are faced with highly, highly violent or uh, highly volatile uh, individuals uh, based on some of their um, some of their drug-induced uh, symptoms. You will get to to give you a little bit of a preview. You will get quite a bit of information on this during your. Uh, the defensive tactics and use of force uh, course with Sergeant Youngman. Uh, he's a, a statewide expert in, in this topic. And uh, so I'm gonna defer any questions to Sergeant Youngman for that. Um, but please ask those questions when you get him. He, he's very, very intelligent uh, and well studied on that topic. 
once they graduate the academy, it's a great day for us because we get it back. We get to welcome our people back home. We get to say, yes, you're here. Let's send you back out. We conduct, uh, prior to the sending them back on the road, we conduct another 40 hours of firearms training with these people. Uh, the reason we do that is to recheck their skills and introduce some new skills to them that, uh, that maybe they weren't quite ready for uh, when they were brand new because it's like drinking from a fire hose where you can't retain it all. So we try to space that out. After their 40 hours of post, what we call post-academy firearms training, they'll go on post-academy field training. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we evaluate the employee, the deputy recruit, as we call them, uh, for their skills. So they go through intense, intense daily scrutiny. They're assigned a, a senior deputy who's trained in a 40-hour course uh, from the state of Washington, from the Criminal Justice Training Commission, as a field training officer. So these deputies are trained to evaluate uh, skills and knowledge on our deputies and how to document that, uh, that those skills and knowledge. So that intense daily scrutiny is uh, conducted through what we call daily observation reports. Daily observation reports for us and for me specifically are something I review every day. I look at daily observation reports from all of our deputy recruits that are in the program and currently we have 16. Uh, so it's a lot to read. <laughs> Um, those daily observation reports, they uh, record everything from uh, the person's ability to drive, the person's ability to write, how much time it takes them to write, to the courtesy that they're showing the community, to the relationships that they're building with the community and with other deputies, uh, to their physical control and voice command on a call. So it's really evaluating, there are 26 different categories that they're evaluated on. And each one of those, they're evaluated as if they're a solo deputy. The standard we hold is what we call a solo deputy acceptable standard. So if I were to put that recruit out on the street without anyone else, that they could perform the functions of that job in that category at a solo deputy standard. Uh, that's what you would expect as a community member receiving that service from, uh, from one of your officers. So we evaluate them. No person can pass the program until they've reached solo deputy uh, on, on the, uh, the categories. Each one, of those, uh, each one of those categories is evaluated under the guise of four different phases. Each phase lasts typically four weeks. We do allow for early transfer out of a phase if there is a, a track record of all positive, uh, positive scores. Uh, so the phases are broken down into, into uh, orientation, technology, investigative, and proactive slash shadow. So the orientation phase is not orientation as in like a new hire orientation. Orientation is referring to geography and your knowledge of what's going on around you, um, your ability to ensure that you know where you're at all the time, your ability to ensure you know where your partners are at and what your partners are doing, and to comprehend what the calls that are coming in and actually kind of show that comprehension and be able to handle them appropriately. During the orientation phase, there are, uh, there are requirements for different kind of proactive uh, traffic stops. There's requirements for them to, uh, to, to be able to contact citizens of the community in a non-investigative uh, uh, way. So we call it a social contact, where you may just walk up to someone and strike up a conversation. Um, we're evaluating that to ensure that our deputies can talk um, and aren't scared to talk to people. Uh, once they've proven their abilities there, then they move on to our technology phase. Our cars are loaded with technology. We have everything from GPS to computer screens to computer-aided dispatch uh, that's uh, providing information to us real time um, to lights and sirens and all the different things and radios. Uh, it's a lot going on in the car. Uh, one of the reasons we send our, our people to uh, what we call emergency vehicle operations course of driving uh, is because of all that extra stuff that they're required uh, to manage in the vehicle. You may drive down the road and see a police officer with a computer screen in front of their face. And you may be saying, are they just looking at email or what are they doing? No, typically they're looking at our, our CAD system, our computer aided dispatch system. That system tells them where they're going. It tells them what's going on, where they're going, who called, what the topic of the call is. 
what the caller is saying, what the suspect, their behavior may be doing. That's supported by radio traffic that our dispatchers are so good at providing to us. So the dispatchers will read and give us the information, um, but they will also add supplemental information into that. So if you do see a, an officer looking at his computer, but he doesn't have his lights and sirens on, it doesn't mean that he's just looking at email or playing on the computer. He's probably actually going to a call. Not all calls for us are what we call priority calls. And that doesn't mean it's not a priority to the community. It means that we're not driving lights and sirens to every call. Uh, the reason is because driving lights and sirens creates an additional risk to the community. So we need to make sure that if we are doing that, that the benefits of us getting to that call fast with our lights and sirens outweigh the risk that we're providing to the community by going through stoplights and those kind of things. So during that technology phase, we ensure that they're able to do that. We evaluate them on, on those things. Then we move on to the investigative phase. The investigative phase is where we really try to see, can they take a call? Can they do follow up? Can they, can they contact people and really get to the root cause? Can they assist detectives in solving a crime? All those different types of uh, investigative side of things. They're required to contact people in what we call uh, write field information reports or interview, interview reports where something may not even be criminal, but we still want them to follow up on it and look into it, suspicious circumstances types of things. They then have certain criteria they have to meet there, and then they can move on to what we call our proactive phase, phase four. Proactive phase is where we really look to see, are they doing that community-oriented policing? Are they going out, finding problems in the community, cleaning the community up, looking at uh, different issues that may be a uh, hot topic, whether it's speeding, whether it's uh, different types of uh, encampments, whether it's different uh, things that may be a priority to uh, the chief or their sergeant or their supervisors, or that they just see as out of the ordinary. Um, so we evaluate them for that, and they're required to conduct several uh, proactive stops uh, that they have to generate on their own without being dispatched to or being pointed out by their FTO to ensure that they're actually going to be that community-oriented cop. Um, once we have felt comfortable with them doing that and they, they receive positive scores, we'll move them on to a shadow phase. Uh, the shadow phase is uh, kind of important for us. It's our last chance to really, while they're under that daily scrutiny, look at how they're going to do as a uh, solo deputy. So the FTO will get, in, uh, get out of the car, check out their, they'll take their own car. The recruit will then check out a cool car and go out and conduct law enforcement in the community. The FTO will stay close by and monitor and make contact victims that they dealt with, people that they interviewed, places they stopped, conduct all different kinds of follow-up to see not if the crime was solved, but how did their deputy do? Were they respectful? Did they talk to you? Did they solve the problem? Did they provide the service that you expected from them? Those types of things are, are done. Okay. Questions, colleagues? Mm -hmm. um, how much continuing education training do officers receive after these initial ones? And I think that could be something yep. that, that Sergeant Clark will get into a little bit in terms of the training. Yep. It's a two part question. Okay. Second part is do they also continue to get field observation during their employment? Okay, those are both great questions. The, what uh, I will consider ongoing training. I got jumped a little bit ahead of me, so it's uh, that's, we're going to address that here in just a minute. I have several slides on that, um, so I'm not going to, I won't give too much of a preview. <laughs> and then uh, the ongoing evaluations, yes, our employees do receive uh, eva performance appraisals, we call them, performance evaluations from their supervisor. Uh, they are mandatory to happen once a year, uh, once you've been on the department and off probation. After FTO, once they're released from shadow to what we call the field force, where we put them out on the road, they're solo deputy, they've been signed off, they can go out and be uh, a, a police officer out in the, in the community. Uh, they do receive for that first year of their employment, they'll receive a monthly evaluation from their sergeant, their direct sergeant. And that's something that's then provided back to the training division where I work, uh, where we will review those performance evaluations and evaluate whether or not that employee is meeting our standard uh, whether or not they need retraining in anything, or uh, quite honestly, if they're not being a good representative of our, of our department or community. Uh, that is our opportunity. So employees are still at will employees uh, up to that year of probation uh, that they are provided. Yep. 
proactive stops, how many of those are they required to do? So it varies on the, on the stages. Uh, and it's, it's tough to tell you because it's all broken out uh, and there's a lot of different categories. Um, but we consider proactive stops, things like traffic stops for, uh, for taillight out or speeding or something like that. And for example, in phase one, they're required to do 20 of those uh, in phase one. If you imagine 20 traffic stops can take quite a while to accomplish, uh, to balance that with all the 911 calls that we have that we're responsible for as well. And all the other follow-up and other duties like writing reports and uh, booking evidence and all those types of things that we have to do. Uh, so 20 traffic stops there and then 10 traffic stops for each other one. Uh, we are required to do five in the proactive phase, five uh, proactive stops, uh, three of which must result in an arrest. Uh, so you may say, well, how do you make that happen? Um, it's not something that we force on our people. If there's, for example, they're making the stops, they're looking for stuff, they're fighting people, but nothing quite results in arrest, we can make exceptions for that. Uh, we try not to shove the metric down their throats. Uh, it's really uh, what we're looking for is the competency to conduct the investigation and the, the stop. Uh, the reason we have to put a number on it is to ensure that we do have some kind of standard. Uh, if we just said go out and make traffic stops, that looks different in different areas. Different areas are busier with 911 calls than others. So we had to come up with some sort of standard um, uh, for that process. Our whole FTO program is based on what's called the San Jose model of field training uh, developed in San Jose, California. Um, so that's what we follow. It's a statewide standard, uh, again, that we are trained on and that we follow. Um, we do modify some of the requirements to meet our community's need that follow up proactive phase. That's something that we want in our community. We want our deputies to be out there solving problems. So he's clarifying, initially he said that seems a little problematic, stop and arrest quotas. No, <laughs> there's no stop and arrest quota. Uh, when we talk about that proactive phase, again, we say three should result in an arrest. If none of them do, but the person is out there uh, finding problems in the community, it is not shaken down. We don't. We don't have shakedowns in Pierce County. It's not a thing, it's illegal. We don't do that. We still have to follow uh, the Constitution of the United States and the state of Washington. Uh, and we have to have reasonable suspicion to, to stop someone and probable cause to arrest them. You can't make those up for anything other than facts and circumstances. So um, while, again, it may seem like there's sort of a quota, it's not a quota uh, because there's no uh, incentive tied to it due to the fact that we can adjust that based on activity uh, within the community. Trying to get them to show that they yeah. can do the job. Yeah, so you got to prove that you can do the job. And if what we don't want is someone that sits in the driver's seat and eats donuts all day and does nothing. That's not something that, that you want to pay a police officer to do. That's not something I want to pay a police officer. I'm a taxpayer as well. I want my police officers out there solving problems. And that's what we're looking for. I will tell you, I have moved people out of the proactive phase and the shadow phase with no arrests. Uh, but they've shown that they're active, they're being active, they're looking. Uh, and their FTOs will document that though it didn't result in an arrest, it was a great stop. They saw a suspicious circumstance uh, and they contacted the person. And you know whether they were able to develop probable cause or there was just nothing criminal that was involved, it's still a good stop for them to make to solve that problem in the community. So thank you for clarifying. Uh, here's that probation uh, uh, thing. So we again are providing that monthly performance evaluation. Those monthly performance evaluations are covering everything from are they attending their mandatory training? Are they um, are they being a good team player? Are they enforcing the law fairly and equally? Are they getting complaints from the community? Are they getting compliments from the community? Those types of things are evaluated. During this phase, there are no uh, metrics for numbers other than training hours. Uh, they have to make sure that they're meeting their state mandated 24 hours of ongoing training, uh, which I'm going to get into next. <laughs> so the state uh, requirement for every law enforcement officer all throughout the state of Washington is 24 hours of ongoing training. Um, 
you will find many departments in the state of Washington are struggling to meet that this year uh, due to COVID restrictions. Things that we normally do, like uh, 10 hours of defensive tactics training, 10 hours of firearms twice a year, 10 hours of uh, case law and uh, first aid training and those kind of things are kind of have been givens for us. Um, I would say on average, based on looking through our training uh, stats that we keep, uh, we the average officer is doing about 60 to 100 hours annually of ongoing training. And that's everything from state uh, mandated training to department mandated training. The state requires every single officer in the state of Washington has to receive eight hours of crisis intervention training. That eight hours of crisis intervention training uh, was mandated by law and it was not provided initially in the academy until recently. Um, what happened was uh, they then brought those courses out to the community. So every single one of your deputies and officers here in University Place and in the Pierce County Sheriff's Department has attended crisis intervention training. Uh, a percentage of our employees have become real experts at the crisis intervention through a 40 hour, uh, what they call CIT training, um, where they are uh, provided kind of more advanced techniques in, uh, in dealing with people in crisis. That course we're actually going to be hosting next year. Um, later this year, we'll be conducting the planning and we'll be hosting that ourselves um, with the state. So we're pretty excited about that fact because we're going to uh, have a greater number of our own employees that are trained in that 40 hour course, uh, which is uh, pretty phenomenal for us. Additionally, every employee of uh, every uh, police officer in the state of Washington is required to do two hours of annual crisis intervention training. And that's where I talk about things, kind of the hot topics, traumatic brain injuries, autism, those types of things are covered in depth for those officers so that we, when we come across these situations, we're able to handle them appropriately and recognize uh, what may be going on uh, through a true lens rather than our own, our own lens that we have. Every deputy uh, in the Pierce County Sheriff's Department is required to uh, do annual uh, discriminatory harassment training, which we provide one hour of annually. And then a lot of our leaders in the department, uh, well, all of our leaders are required to, but a lot of our informal leaders as well from the deputy level, the officer level, uh, are also going to a four hour, what's called introduction to equities for supervisors training. And that's where you have, again, those hard conversations about equity and diversity and things that uh, that you may not see uh, in, your, in, in yourself and that uh, really having some some good tough conversations about things. We also provide constant legal update training, whether it's through training bulletins that we just email out to online trainings that we push out uh, through uh, with, through the state of Washington system and our own. Legal updates uh, cover everything from case law, which is uh, kind of governs some of our behaviors and activities, to new written RCWs and WACs and different uh, administrative codes and things like that, that, that we must abide by. Um, we take this stuff very seriously and uh, it's something that uh, we push out to all of our people constantly. Uh, post Academy ongoing training uh, continues with EVOC. Our, uh, we have our own uh, emergency vehicle operations uh, course staff that uh, goes to the track. It's a biannual training. Uh, sorry, uh, every other year training. So <laughs> I always mix that up a little bit. Uh, so every other year you're required to go. The majority of officers and deputies that work in a patrol based function go every year. It's fun. You get to go to a, the Washington State Patrol track and drive fast and push your vehicle to the limits so that when you bring it back on the road, you know the limits of the vehicle. Uh, we have to be good drivers because sometimes we do have to uh, uh, disregard some of the laws in order to get places uh, with our red and blue overhead lights and sirens. Um, with that comes a great responsibility for us to ensure that we're doing so safely. That's where we learn how to do that. That's where we learn techniques such as uh, PIT, pursuit intervention technique, where we are able to terminate a pursuit without causing harm to anyone and ending it prior to it getting out of control and 
seeing the, the long OJ Simpson pursuit occur at Pierce County. We do not condone that kind of behavior. We try to end them before using the pursuit intervention technique or using what we call stop sticks, uh, which are able to, uh, to stop vehicles uh, by deflating their tires slowly. Um, our uh, deputies also can uh, go to defensive tactics training, so I'm not going to steal Sergeant Youngman's thunder too much. Uh, he'll talk to you in depth about what we cover there. Uh, but the defensive tactics training that we provide, we have what's called ma uh, master defensive tactics instructors through the state of Washington. And they're also uh, certified through the city of Seattle Police Department as black shirts, which is their uh, version of a master DT instructor. Um, we're very proud of our staff and defensive tactics. Uh, I would say we are industry leaders in our uh, techniques, both in de-escalation and uh, in using force that's reasonable and necessary uh, to conduct law enforcement. Um, sometimes uh, force is not pretty. Uh, sometimes it's, it's uh, quite frankly appalling and ugly and hard to watch. Uh, we want to ensure that when we do have to use force, we're trained at a high level and able to do so in a, in a manner that's controlled and reasonable to the best of our ability. Go ahead. Uh, the two hours per year of crisis intervention seems low given the amount of topics that need to be covered and for what they could encounter in the field, especially for those that did not do the 40 hour CIT. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's tough, right? Um, so one of the cool things that our department has done to combat that, because quite frankly, we are not trained crisis responders uh, for mental health and uh, other behavioral types of crisis. One of the cool things our department has done is led a pilot, uh, which is uh, industry leading um, in, the, in the, the country of co-responders, crisis co-responders. We've teamed up with MultiCare, uh, the large uh, hospital uh, group in the area, and we actually have mental health counselors on staff that respond with us to some of these crisis calls. If we recognize a crisis call, that it may be something a little more advanced, we're able to call them and have them come out in the field with us. They drive their own vehicles, they have bulletproof vests, and they come out and handle those problems. They have direct access to multi-care's multi health system, whether it's their, their health record system, so they can look up some of the past history on some of these folks, uh, and also access to the doctors themselves, and, and more access to be able to help provide those resources to them. So yes, I would agree. Uh, I'm not gonna to sugarcoat it. Uh, there's definitely more that could be done. Um, I think that we have led, this, led the way on providing additional resources for officers. Because you got to remember, we also have to deal with the other part of law enforcement. And if all we do is train, then we're not on the road doing our job. Um, so we have to balance that. And one of the ways we've done that is to have those people come in. You will get a pretty in-depth presentation uh, about the co-responder system. So again, I don't want to steal too much of their thunder, but it is uh, pretty cool. Alex, I, was, I would say that we incorporated as well into those other areas. So in our defensive tactics, yeah. even our firearms, there's a crisis intervention component to it. It Absolutely. may not be a you know, dedicated hours of it, but it's it's right. a component of a lot of our training. Now. Yeah, it's it's a it's a hot topic, uh, not and it's not a fleeting topic. It is here to stay. It is something that, uh, like Chief uh, Primo said, it's it's something that we do incorporate. Just like the academy incorporates it, you can only equate the formal training to so much. But again, it is uh, woven throughout the fabric of our uh, of our training. <clears throat> Okay, so um, how is the training composition decided? Is it content mandated by law, or does the department have the discretion on what topics to cover and how much time to spend on each? For the crisis uh, specifically, those trainings are uh, developed and uh, basically decided on by the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission um, for those specific uh, topics uh, that, that are covered. Um, but for all of our other training, um, for example, defensive tactics training, that's driven by our department, what we see and, uh, and what we're doing. And that may be something from, hey, our guys are uh, having to do a lot of uh, uh, handcuffing of compliant subjects. So let's make sure that we're honing on those skills to, to ensure that we're not injuring people doing that. Uh, our people are 
having to use uh, different types of force. So let's focus on making sure that we're well trained on that. Or it might be something like uh, in, in firearms training, uh, learning different techniques so that we may not have to approach situations and get ourselves into those situations where we may have to use that type of force. Uh, someone has a comment here. Um, I think it's also more on how you approach someone. It is unknown and that initial context sets the tone for whatever happens. This way it doesn't lead to a crisis. Yeah, and that's part of that de-escalation mm -hmm. where we try to teach our people and teach ourselves not to put ourselves in those poor situations. That could be something as easy as number of deputies on the scene. Um, officer presence is in fact a, uh, a, a real thing. If there are two of me, um, it's sometimes easier to de-escalate a situation because the person may not feel that they can get the upper hand. Uh, if there's one of me and I approach in a soft, caring, compassion way, that might be a better approach. Sometimes you have to speak to people in a little bit more of a forceful way uh, to get their attention, but there's nothing wrong with stepping it back and say, okay, now that we're, now we're on the same page, let's you know, settle this down and come to a logical conclusion. And I just, I just, since everyone can hear me, I wanted to share a quick story that one of our UP officers shared at a block watch meeting. Uh, there was a individual um, who was having a, a mental episode in the middle of Orchard and Cirque. Mm -hmm. So that's a very busy intersection. Yep. Uh, officers were called to the scene by multiple people driving by, yep. trying to help him get out of the road. So you had one officer on each side of the road trying to coach him back. The people who passed by were yelling at the officers to stop harassing him. And so I just want to make sure everybody realizes sometimes in an effort to mitigate those circumstances, what seems and appears to be maybe escalating or harassing right. was really just an effort to try to get him out of the road. That's a great example. And I, I have personal examples of very similar uh, scenarios with subjects that are um, naked in the middle of the road. And we have to shut down major highways sometimes to to ensure that they're you know not getting hit those kind of things it sometimes it's not you're seeing a glimpse of what the entire scenario is um, and sometimes it's it may look like too much but at the same time with numbers also comes the less need for use of force in a lot of cases if i have two of two of us one can grab each arm we may not i may not have to use as much force as i may if i was by myself and have to really take control of the situation so Every situation is different. Uh, it's, this is one of the hardest parts for me to understand when I was new and for people to understand is that there's a lot of what we call gray area uh, in law enforcement where things are not necessarily written down of this is the procedure that you do every time because it's, it's not all the same. Okay, so uh, there's a question about is the training content, I'm trying to clarify if there's talking specific training developed internally or brought in from an outside source, which I think you'd have a mix. Yeah, so we have a mix. So uh, a lot of our uh, crisis intervention training is developed uh, from external sources. Uh, our, uh, our use of force training, our uh, firearms training, our basic uh, you know, emotional intelligence training, that stuff is developed internally with influences from outside sources. We didn't create this wheel, right? We didn't create law enforcement. We have a lot of good experience. We send our instructors for different certifications throughout the country so that they can bring those experiences back and take the best of all those worlds. Um, one of the examples is that ethics training and the emotional survival training. We use Dr. Gil Martin's uh, emotional survival for law enforcement book, uh, which uh, we use in order to, um, to train on that. So it's a guide for us, but that training was, isn't the emotional survival for law enforcement training and is developed internally by us with a special emphasis on what we um, need as a department. So she's asking the training the department requires of itself. So I'm wondering if she means, I mean, some of it's state mandated, mm -hmm. some of it, I don't know if it's policy dictated. Yeah. So there's no, there's no requirement from the state that you have to do eight hours of defensive ongoing training. That's a department thing that we, that we do. That's a policy. Uh, that our sheriff uh, has decided that he wants uh, us to do that amount of ongoing training in order for us to ensure that we're um, that we're meeting his standard and that we're meeting the community standard. So some of it is driven internally. Uh, there's no mandate that uh, we do ongoing 
driving training. We do that internally so that uh, we're able to, um, uh, to to perform well. That's okay. Oh, yeah. this is the last one. Oh. Okay. No, it's, uh, okay. it's fine. <laughs> okay. Is there any other questions? No, um, just some comments. The, the training, the department requires of itself, and you can have training in a specific area, but each person you come in contact with is going to have a different reaction, especially those that are on the spectrum. Yeah, it's every, every situation is different. Every person different reacts in a certain way. All right. Well, if there's not any more questions, uh, I'd like to close out and just uh, say from my perspective, uh, I think and I am confident that our department does uh, some of the best training of any agency uh, in the state of Washington. Uh, we have high uh, mandates for our for our deputies and officers to uh, ensure that they are top of the line, top caliber uh, people that are out here in the community doing doing this job. Um, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to come out and speak to you guys about this. Uh, it's something that is ongoing. It's a, we are not perfect, just like no no one is perfect. Uh, and so we're constantly striving and looking at ways that we can improve ourselves. And uh, it's something that uh, is never a, never a master of the craft. We're always improving. So I did I did put a last little fish on out there okay. to see if I can get some more yeah. questions and. Um, one more we came in. How many staff are employed full time as trainers across the department? Uh, full time as trainers is myself and uh, Sergeant Clark, uh, who is also going to talk to you guys about some crisis uh, training. Sergeant Clark is my supervisor. He's a training supervisor. I'm considered the training coordinator. Uh, we are two full time uh, training staff. We also have a captain who's in charge of the training division. Uh, and he splits his time between training and backgrounds and hiring and recruitment. So uh, he's considered the administrative captain. Um, so two of us. Uh, however, we do have several subject matter experts in the different fields. So I don't profess to be an expert on use of force. I don't profess to be an expert on driving. I am not the expert in a lot of things. <laughs> um, so we rely on certain people as an extra duty uh, assignment for them to become the expert in those different assignments and bring their real world experience. One of the benefits of not having full time instructors that are stuck in training is that we have the ability to bring real time information back to our program, real time information back to our defensive tactics program. What's working? What's not real time information back to our EVOC program? What's working? What's not? Those that feedback from the deputies that are working in the field and officers that are working in the field, that real time information is, I think, much more beneficial than having someone uh, sitting behind a desk like me uh, uh, dictating what goes out without that real world application at the time. Sergeant Youngman, for example, that's going to come in and talk to you. He's a sergeant on a graveyard and central patrol. He works daily with our folks on the graveyard shift. Uh, and does a lot of work during his shift uh, to improve and continue to improve our program based on what he sees actually real world out in the field. A couple more questions yep. coming in. Does either PCSD or UPPD have a reserve officer program? Uh, both. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's all kind of uh, the same ultimately, uh, but University Place does have a reserve officer program. Very, I would say, go out on a limb, more active than most. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, it's a great opportunity to get your fingers uh, into law enforcement and see if it's something that you want, or if you just have that drive, but you have another career that you that you don't want to give up because you like that too. It's a great way to get involved in our community and be a servant to our community and truly help us out because we need it. Uh, we need your help. So um, by all means, it's a great program. And something that uh, we would I would encourage anyone to do if they're interested. Okay, uh, both David and Wendy um, appreciate the hard work you guys do. Uh, David says he's only interested in CIT training because I have a child on the spectrum and know that it's an increasing issue that might require more training. Wendy also works with spectrum kids who are in the community. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, another question is there a hiring incentive for foreign language or bachelor's degree or higher? Uh, so foreign language, no. Uh, 
Uh, though it is preferred, uh, we have a lot of uh, foreign language speakers on our department. Um, there is an education incentive, not necessarily as a bonus or anything like that when you get hired, but you do get increased pay. You have 1% additional pay for the first six years of your employment. Uh, if you have an associate's degree, if you have a bachelor's degree, you get 2% more for the first six years of your employment with the department um, to help with that. So. And of course, we encourage uh, higher education and, and, and like that as well. All right. Um, OK, guys, it's your last last chance to ask any questions you might have. Um, and then uh, I think uh, Alex did a great job. I'm so glad we started with him. It was wonderful to, to really understand the hiring and training, particularly at the academy and the changes that have been made there. And um, thank you, Deputy Richards. Great information and appreciate your time. And really impressed, lots of great comments. I'm gonna toss it over to Chief Primo, who's gonna close out the meeting. Yeah, th thanks, Alex. I, I appreciate you being here. Um, you know, I, this is my, my fourth community academy that I've attended, uh, been a part of facilitating. Uh, my first one here in UP, and I, I always walk away from these sessions learning something new. Even though I've been in law enforcement with the county for 27 years, um, there's always new things that are out there and things that we're doing. Um, so I just really appreciated uh, your presentation and the information, because like I said, I, I learned some new stuff about our, our own department and the processes. Um, I know some of the people that are on here have been to uh, our community academies in the past, and uh, I guess I just wanted to make a comment that I, I miss the in-person, uh, you know, opportunity for us to see each other uh, face to face and having that kind of classroom atmosphere. Um, so uh, bear with us with with how this is. Um, you know, we had some challenges at the beginning with microphones and and cameras and those types of things but I, I still hope that uh, you enjoyed the time it was time well spent and that you got something out of it um if you have any comments um that you'd like to share about how things went you know maybe we need to set something up differently uh to make the experience a little bit better um i'm sure alex is fine with you know comments on his presentation if you have any areas that maybe he didn't touch on that you felt uh that we could add for future ones Feel free to send those to us as well. Um, I think. Do you want to give them a preview for next week? So yeah, next next week. Um, well, before I even jump into that, I'm I'm gonna we it's seven thirty just after seven thirty. I'll open up if you have any questions about UPPD or anything right now since we have a few minutes. Um, I'll, I'll go. If you do shoot those over, Jennifer can. Uh, ask me about those uh, while I kind of talk about next week. So um, next week we have use of force. Um, Alex talked about that. We have uh, Sergeant Jason Youngman, who is our lead DT instructor um, coming in, going to talk about a lot of the training that we go through, uh, do a few demonstrations. So we're going to have some activity here that we're going to try and cover um, uh, on the camera for you as well. Um, I think it'll be really informative. Uh, so hopefully you can you can tune in next week as well. Um, I think that was about it that we had. Um, no, if there's no other questions. I did throw it out there. UPPD questions. Crime okay. and safety. I don't know if you. Looks like everybody is excited. They all enjoyed Good. it. Good. It great comments. Just a, yeah. some some speaker um, uh, changes that we'll make here internally, but nothing. Yeah. OK. Good. Um, well. Then I guess with that, uh, thank you so much for for being here, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Same same bat channel, same bat time. Yeah. All thank right. you all. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks. See ya.